Hey everyone, last video and this one hopefully will be pretty short. We have talked about osmotic pressure, we have talked about safety, and now we are going to focus on what activity tells us and recap this entire unit. So, what does activity tell us? Well, remember that AI can also be expressed as gamma I times XI, and gamma is 1 for ideal solution. So activity is a, a mole fraction modified to capture how things are non-ideal. Okay, so when things are ideal, we have it's just x, and when otherwise, it's not. And the way that it is modified is uh, it responds to intermolecular interactions in more realistic ways than ideal solution does. And if you dive way back into what we were doing in the first place, you remember we had fugacity equals fugacity uh, way back. Well, that was based on free energy equals free energy, if you recall. So if you dive in and go look at all the definitions of things in your book, you'll see that this is kind of sitting on top of um, Gibbs free energy being equal across the system. And that means that that helps us think about activity in a way that is broader. So for example, at equilibrium, we have the activities being equal, which means that uh, activities move activities will move towards equality. It tells us about the driving force. So if you have some place where there is a lot of something and some place adjacent to some place where there is less of it, it moves in that direction. And uh, here is a really cool, fun example of that. Let's imagine I have a potato chip and I let it sit out on the counter overnight. Well, what's going to happen to that potato chip? It's probably going to get like stale and soggy. And this explains what's going on. So the uh, activity of water in the chip is very, very low. Maybe it's, you know, uh, 0.1, for example. Um, and you say, all right, that's great, but I didn't drop the chip into a cup of water. Um, well, what's the activity of water in air? You might ask yourself. And I know this is going to seem strange, but you actually know the equation for what AW is in air. You do. Think about this for a moment. Hit pause and do it. You ready? All right, I'm going to reveal it. It is the water activity in air is the activity times P sat for the water, a.k.a. relative humidity. What? Yes, it's true. And that's why when they... Uh, uh, the, the people who measure water activity for foods for a living don't do the calculation we did. They actually practically measure it by measuring the equilibrium uh, relative humidity in the air around their potato chips or what have you. And so the reason your chip goes stale is if you check the relative humidity and think of that as though it was the activity of water, it's usually, unless you live in, say, Arizona or something, um, a lot higher than the water activity in your chip or um, cracker. And that's why they'll go stale. So activity tells us a whole lot. It's so useful. Oh my gosh, I love this concept. Anyway. All right, finally, the recap of mixtures. So this entire unit has been about uh, the properties of fluids and mixtures. And we can think about fluids, that is single component 
mixtures as a special case of mixtures. So really, this whole unit has been about mixtures. And so what do we want to know about mixtures? So we want to know, going way back, we want to be able to know the properties of our components or mixtures, um, including the molar volume, uh, because these are not usually just straightforward calculations of 50% of this and 50% of that. We want to know when stuff boils. We want to know about other equilibria, which count things like osmotic pressure, food safety, and when we are not at equilibrium, which way does our driving force point? Driving force, that is, how far out of equilibrium are we, <clears throat> and which way are things going to move? So these are all the things we have been able to calculate one way or another. Um, and I want to give us a heuristic for what we do when we do this sort of thing. Okay, and all of these things are better if calculated with activity rather than assuming, to begin with, ideal solution. So you always start by thinking, well, fugacity equals fugacity. Now what am I going to do? And then... You make some assumptions. Are we at low pressure? Uh, are we uh, having containing so little of a substance in our mixture that we can probably get away with ideal solution or some such thing? And is there any experimental data? But for mixtures, there quite often isn't because there's an infinite number of mixtures. So then step three, you choose a model. So what in what way is it you are going to describe the uh, non-idealities of this system? There is no one model that does everything. And finally, you solve. So if it's modified Reynolds Law, you've got three equations. That is Reynolds Law written for substance A, Reynolds Law with, a, with the uh, activity coefficient, modified Reynolds Law written for substance B, and then that the sum of the mole fractions has to be 1. And then your final step, your final step should always be to go back and compare to any sort of data to validate if your model is any good. And sometimes, as I said, there's an infinite number of mixtures, so you won't have exactly your situation in data, but you might have a somewhat similar situation in the data that you can compare to that gives you confidence that your extrapolation is going to be good. Okay, after this, we're going to add our final level of complexity. Oh my gosh, that's right, we are headed into reactions. Dun, dun, dun. See you later.